Hello. Welcome to the podcast, Byzantium and Friends. I'm Anthony, your host. Today's discussion is of a topic that cuts closer to some of my own research interests um, compared to other uh, episodes that we've had. And specifically, it focuses on certain meta issues uh, relating to the uh, academic field of Byzantine studies. So in the in history and in the humanities, academic fields are somewhat artificial entities. I don't mean to say by that that they are fake in any way. It's just that they are specific constructs that emerge um, under you know very particular political or social circumstances, under the influence of specific ideologies. And, you know, the way in which we define some fields by a region or by a by a faith or by a language, uh, we just carve up the world into convenient ways or ways that are more or less ideologically defined. So if you think about it, the fields of classics and Byzantine studies and Islamic studies or the history of Judaism, they all just cut across history in different ways and they intersect in different ways, and that's because they're the product of specific interests, uh, not necessarily the way in which the world is articulated, right? So we're not necessarily carving the world up at the joints here. We're, we're, we're running our own interests uh, through and across different periods and places and, and groups of people. Now, some fields have invested heavily in investigating their own history, the circumstances under which they emerged and flourished, their ideological priorities and blind spots, and compared, for example, to Byzantine studies, which has invested very little in this kind of endeavor, fields such as the classics and Islamic studies and even Western medieval studies are somewhat more self-critical, maybe not as much as They could be, but certainly more so than Byzantine studies. In Byzantine studies, this is a huge blind spot. We don't actually have a history of the field. Instead, we have more or less, we have one of two things. Lists of dates of publications of important books or editions of texts, you know, from the 16th century on. And relatively hagiographical studies of, you know, the great pioneers, you know, late 19th century, 20th century figures. Yeah, there's there's a little bit more than that, but it's not very systematic, and it's not a recognized subdiscipline of the field, uh, though I imagine that it's going to grow um, very, very quickly uh, in the coming years. There are already signs of that, and specifically what we need to be is critical about the the ideological context in which certain key decisions were made in setting this field uh, apart uh, from, you know, carving it out of the rest of history. Now, most of you are certainly aware that Byzantium has encoded certain very negative stereotypes and, and prejudices, especially in, in Western Enlightenment-style historiography, um, and that it has been an effort to you know, bring Byzantium out of the shadow of those negative stereotypes and into today what is more, you know, a kind of neutral place from which it can be studied. Conversely, there Byzantium has also had a certain number of alleged positive connotations, sort of selling points. And in my mind, those are equally problematic um, as the more prejudicial ones. Uh, so especially when Byzantium is presented... Um, as a sort of mystical and spiritual age of faith. And, it, you know, this is used to sell museum tickets, it, but it, it's also a product that is set before the consumer interests of a sort of bourgeois society. Uh, it, it, it fills a specific place, a niche in the market of consumer goods, which includes cultures um, that is set before our society, and, and, and scholarship is, is complicit in that. So the question before us ultimately is whether the rubric of Byzantium, um, which is an artificial modern term uh, that does a certain amount of injustice to the civilization or society in question, whether it's redeemable, uh, like whether we can actually keep it in the long run once we understand exactly how it operates and the kind of work that it has done, which has brought us to this point. 
My guest today shares a number of the concerns that I also have, and uh, this was a wonderful discussion um, that we had as, as we kind of worked through our uh, the problems that we have with the term and you know interpretive rubric of Byzantium and uh, what, what some of the problems and challenges would be if we tried to replace it with something else. Uh, she's Leonora Neville, uh, Chair of History at the University of Wisconsin, uh, and also the first guest I had on this podcast. Uh, so if you go back to episode one, you will find her very insightful analysis of Byzantine gender. And in fact, gender, uh, as you will hear, is v very close to the topic of whether the rubric Byzantium can still be defended. It, it, it was a gendered rubric to begin with. Uh, so if we want to get out of those categories, perhaps we might need to uh, abandon it. Uh, this was, for me, a very stimulating conversation. I enjoyed it immensely. I hope you do, too. Many thanks also to Medievalist.net for reposting these uh, episodes on, on their website. Uh, so here's my discussion with Leonora Neville. Uh, hello, guest number one. Hey there. You're back. You, you, this episode will be in the 40s, so that's something. All right. Can you remember a year ago when, when, when we started this? It seems very long ago. Oh, yeah. But only been a year? Uh, closer. A, a little bit more, yeah. All right. I think we recorded in something like September, something like that. Yeah. All right. So our discussion today is, well, there are a number of ways of, uh, of calling it. So we're either going to interrogate the term Byzantium um, as to whether it's appropriate for what we study uh, and talk about the biases that it encodes and the things that it has been used to do. Um, and this can be seen as part of a broader project that a number of people are talking about these days, which is decolonizing Byzantium, which is, so it's, it's, a, it's an example of that. And, and so understanding that our area of study has been colonized by outside interests. <laughs> and and it, one of the ways that they've done that is to impose the label Byzantium on it. Mm -hmm. Right. So we'll be talking a little bit about that. So we thought it might be a good idea for me to give a very brief overview of those terms, Byzantine and Byzantium, just to kind of set the stage so that people know where these come from and what they mean. And then we'll set about tearing them apart. Is that, is that what we're doing? Possibly, yes. I okay. Think. Um, so very, very briefly, uh, Byzantium was the name of the city that was founded in the archaic Greek period, yeah, you know, uh, 6th, 7th century BC um, at, at the site where Constantine later built the city of Constantinople. So this was a city in, in Greek antiquity and Roman antiquity. Um, and Constantine kind of leveled the place and he built Constantinople on it. And Constantinople's name was both that and New Rome. But the its residents and the writers of the empire that we call Byzantium continued to refer to the city as a kind of archaizing term as Byzantium and its inhabitants as Byzantine sometimes. It's not very common, but it does happen. Um, it was somewhat archaic. Uh, so I don't know if maybe like calling England Albion or something like that. And there are a few, possibly two, like in the thousand years plus of Byzantine history, there may be a couple of instances where Byzantium is used as a word for the whole Eastern Empire. Uh, it, it, it never becomes established or anything like that. The terms that they used for the empire was either the polity of the Romans or the, the state of the Romans or the empire of the Romans or whatever, or Romania, which means Roman land, and its inhabitants or citizens were called Romans. And that continued down to the end of the empire. In the West, starting around the ninth century, the Eastern empire was called, began to be called the empire of the Greeks or the empire of Constantinople, or sometimes the empire of New Rome. That's when they wanted to be respectful. And that was a term that was dominant in the West down to the 19th century. Now the term Byzantine started around the 16th century to be used in the West, but I think, so I've done some research on this, I'm publishing an article on, on its usage, that that was usually as a synonym for Constantinople. 
So instead of saying the empire of Constantinople, or which is clunky, the Constantinopolitan empire, they would just substitute the term Byzantine. So if you look at like Gibbon, he doesn't use the term Byzantine or Byzantium. They are for, he reserves those very few occasions for the capital, right? It was in the 19th century that that the, the standard terms empire of the Greeks declined and Byzantium kicks in in the later 19th century for reasons that I explained in that article, we don't have to get into it. And it was toward the end of the 19th century that the discipline of Byzantine studies was formed. And that's what we inhabit today. But the term Byzantine was used to replace empire of the Greeks which during the course of the 19th century became a difficult term because of the whole political context of the Eastern question and all of that. We don't need to get into that now. So it's been what, like 130 years of Byzantine studies more as an established thing. And so we're gonna be asking, what are the problems with that? So Leonora, would you wanna start off like just a overview of what is the main problem with that term? Why does it rub you the wrong way? Well, I think that using the terms uh, Byzantine and Byzantium isn't good for understanding the field uh, or for doing scholarship in the field for a couple of reasons. Um, perhaps the most important, it's just not true. Um, there wasn't a Byzantine empire. Um, as you said, this is a much later term. So we're just lying, right? And every time when we talk about the Byzantines instead of the Romans, we're speaking falsehood. Um, and as a historian, I want to try to get things right, however much I can or I can't. I think we should all be intending to speak truth in as many contexts as possible, and particularly when we're acting as historians. Um, I think talking about the Byzantine Empire, which is always a way of distinguishing it from the other Roman Empire, the earlier Roman Empire, um, that's a distinction that often leads us into confusion. It leads us astray. It makes it harder for us to do good history and accurate history because we're dividing this thing in half arbitrarily for reasons that don't really have anything to do with the thing itself, but yeah. have to do with the work that that terminology does for other people. Another major reason is that this usage of Byzantine and Byzantium is not innocent, right? It's substituting a different thing for reality and like what's wrong with reality right there and if you think about that question why do we use the terms byzantine and byzantium then you can see that there's a whole host of different kinds of work that this terminology does and all of that work plays a role in upholding a valorized narrative of western civilization that works to put western civilization as the height of human uh, achievement and progress and um, uphold the notion that it's right and proper for Western civilization to be in charge of the planet and ruling over all other developing peoples, primitive peoples, third world peoples. So the work that the terminology of Byzantium and Byzantine does all upholds that supremacist view of Western civilization. And that's why I think it is fundamentally part of a colonizing discourse that upholds Western supremacy. Um, so there's it's the lack of any kind of innocent, oh, well, we have to call it something else because it would be confusing. That's just a, a specious argument. Plenty of things in history are confusing and you deal with the confusion. But when it comes to Byzantium, it's important to uphold Byzantium because of all this work, most of which people who call themselves Byzantinists just don't think about. They think, oh, I'm not doing that. I have nothing to do with European colonialism, right? Yeah, I'm sure. That. But it's they're upholding a discourse that, in fact, is grounded in that. And I don't think they can avoid it. So I want to get into the details and the, the arguments that hold up this position. And I, I want us to explore them. Okay. But uh, so let me add that. This arbitrary, as you called it, distinction between the ancient Roman Empire and Byzantium often requires historians on either end, on either side, to waste a lot of time trying to define where the change is and what it was. Again, arbitrarily, like, is it the fourth century? Is it the sixth? Is it the seventh? Is it later? And in so doing, they have to lean heavily 
on just made up notions about what constitutes the essential difference mm -hmm. with the result that they distort both sides. Right. Right. So like if you say as like these examples are from prominent historians, right? I'm not I'm not pulling them out of some obscure publication or anything that, well, Byzantium isn't really Roman because it was too small. All of a sudden you're setting up this criterion of size that no ancient Roman historian ever talks about. Right. Or if you say, well, it's not really Roman because there are too many eunuchs or something at the court, like something about the style of it rubs me the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And so then now you've set up a criteria that you're theoretically obligated to carry back into the ancient Roman empire and, and study it that way, but you don't. Right. So are there all these made up reasons? The, the one about eunuchs is a complaint about bad gender, yes. which is about uh, upholding Western masculinity as a particular type of thing by defining it in opposition to what they perceive to be an Eastern Orientalist masculinity. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? yeah and we'll we'll get into all that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and another one is language, like oh, but it's Greek, which then like okay, but the ancient Roman Empire is also Greek in many ways, and these people are bilingual in many contexts. So anyway. Um, but so first I'd like us to address the following kind of issue or objection that one be, might be made is that, well, Byzantium is just basically a neutral translation of say the terms Eastern Roman empire. That's just what we mean in the same way that like today we refer to a country, Germany, its citizens don't call it that. But we all kind of understand that, that, no, that's just what we call it in English, right? And no prejudice is implied. So in our preliminary discussion, you indicated that, no, there's actually a substantive difference between saying a Byzantine man and an East Roman man or something like that. So can you elaborate a little bit on that? I think that Byzantine is a fabulous term if you want to talk about the construct that European historians have made about this, this fake empire and these fake people and what they do, right? Um, but I can't see how you can claim that that's a neutral term for talking about it when you know you're really talking about Romans, right? You're, you're talking about something else. And by using that term, you then have to at every turn explain again, well, no, I actually mean this other thing. I'm saying Byzantine, but I really mean Roman. So every time that we, we use that term, we have to re-clarify that we're not really talking about what we're talking about. Well, why bother to do that? Can't we just, what's wrong with reality? <laughs> and so to me, it's you're, you're upholding this, um, a construct and a vision of the past that does a lot of work in subservience to a vision of the past and how do you, I, you can't extract that one term out of the discourse and have it mean what you want to without also upholding the discourse. Right? Yeah, so let's give a concrete example. So someone you've worked on, um, Anna, Anna uh, yeah. Komnini, the, the historian of the 12th century. So how does she look differently if you apply one or the other term to her? Well, I think if you call her a Byzantine princess, that brings to mind... Kavafi's poem about her as the, the, the lustful, power-hungry woman who wanted to take over and murder her brother and had it snatched from her and her, her eternal anger about that. Um, Byzantine as a term is connected with subservience and deviant sexuality and superstition and the mindless imitation of obsolete motifs um, and the, the gestating of classical texts, but not really paying attention to them, um, you know, because they weren't yet part of the Renaissance. You know how Renaissance thinkers were classicists, but you know, Byzantines, right. they were merely the copyists of these texts. All of that glop is implicated on this portrait of Anna, the Byzantine princess. Um, and since one of the key factors in this vision of Byzantium is that it's filled with powerful women and eunuchs and subservient men who are deviant and not upstanding, um, that upholds the vision of her as transgressive power hungry woman. So when I talk about 
Anna Komnini, the Roman, I'm talking about Anna, the Roman intellectual, right? And that gives us some prayer of a chance of recovering her as a thinker and a historian and someone who's like philosophy and wrote long letters. And yes, in her youth, her husband might have had a lot of power and she probably liked doing politics. Right? I'm not going to say that she was never interested in helping out, you know, um, but there's a lot to that story that we can't see. The minute we call her a Byzantine princess, we're evoking this whole series of associations with that terminology. Yeah. Right? And I know people think, oh, I'm not doing that, you know, but then, you know, you, you read stuff about her and it's pretty clear. Yeah, you kind of do think she's a, a powerful Greek woman, right? Is putting it forward. Yeah, there is a real difference uh, in what I hear. If you call someone a Byzantine princess, especially one who is believed to have sort of vented, right, all of her bitterness uh, and frustrated gender ambitions, right, mm -hmm. into uh, a work that has the shape of a history than if you call her a Roman historian. Right. And she's right. a Roman historian. Yes, she's a Roman historian. But if you call her that, it's like, wait, I don't recognize this person, right, from the bibliography. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, then okay. you would read her, you'd be prompted to read her history in light of the tradition of Roman history. Right? Yes. You know, you'd read it in, in light of, you know, Plutarch and Polybius and Herodotus and those guys. And it would make a lot more sense than if you read it as entirely a, a twisted screed against her hated brother. Okay, so you mentioned earlier European colonizing discourse. So let's unpack that a little bit. Okay. So what is a discourse in your terms? And, and then what is a European colonizing discourse? So I think most academics these days would call a discourse uh, a way of constituting knowledge, a system of knowledge, and the social practices and hierarchies of power and power relations and the forms of subjectivity that go along with that system of knowledge, right? So a discourse about Byzantium is a way of thinking about the Roman Empire and the Eastern Mediterranean and the power relations and the social relations that are both created by that way of thinking about the Roman Empire and that enable that way of thinking about it. So talking about discourses is a way of acknowledging how systems of meaning and systems of names have power and they create power and power creates them and they reinforce it one another. So you can't really, um, you can't have one without the other, right? So that's why fundamentally, I think you can't use this terminology without upholding the whole discourse that went into creating it. Um, and that's why names are worth fighting over. Most of the time when there's a dispute about who gets to name something, what something should be called, and who gets to decide what it's called, that's almost never a fight about the name. It's a fight about power right, over of course. who gets to do the naming. Um, so I would call a European colonizing discourse any ways of constructing knowledge that make it seem both natural and good for Europeans to conquer and rule the primitive people and the third world people and the developing people. So anything that makes it seem right and natural and the good course of action for Europe to have power over the rest of the globe, I would consider part of a European colonizing discourse. Yeah, so to, to give a, an example, possibly the Ur example of this kind of analysis is Said's Orientalism, mm -hmm. right? Where he unpacks the, the, the power dynamics contained within the term Orient and the way it was used if, if you know, our listeners can think of what it would mean to call someone an Oriental um, or to try to explain something in history by reference to, well, that's coming out of an Oriental context, right? So that somehow explains things. And so his idea was, and I should say, I don't know if, do, do people, do like grad students read Orientalism anymore? I don't know if it's like required reading. It's old, but, but it's, yeah. I think it's now just in the water, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it, it's, a, it's a very controversial and there are a lot of problems with it, but I think the core idea is indisputable, mm -hmm. um, that a system of knowledge about Eastern civilizations, and he was primarily concerned with Near East slash Middle East, the, that the knowledge was constructed in such a way as to promote the idea that this part of the world is sort of backwards and 
should be subservient, subordinate to Western uh, powers and interests and will naturally be so. And that the, that system of knowledge, which we're calling a discourse here, extends across so many domains, right? From gender to art, literature, politics, right? And all of that, right? So do you think that Byzantinism, <laughs> do you think that's a subspecies of Orientalism? Because I've suspected that. I think in some ways, I think, um, there's the discourse about that's the negative conversation about Byzantium that's sort of mid to late 19th century through say the 1920s and 30s um, that saw the Byz Byzantine empire as a really grotesque, horrible society. Um, that I think is heavily involved in a critique of um, Byzantine culture that all basically boils down to gender. Um, and that I think is really indistinguishable from a lot of what Said calls Orientalism. Now, whether that was just a spillover from European colonizing discourse about places that were actually trying to colonize in that period onto the past, that's possible. Um, or it also arose from actual study of the Eastern Roman Empire. Um, but that's one of the later manifestations of the, uh, the work that the terminology Byzantium does in service of Western civilization, right? Yeah, let's talk, so, about, let's talk about the particular uh, aspects of that work. So just in the past, you know, 130 years that we've been living within that paradigm. Well, what... I think it starts a lot earlier than that. It, 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 it does. ninth century. You know, when when Charlemagne's courtiers and people of his era decided that he was going to be the Roman Empire, then who got to be the, the heir of Rome and which which successor state was the real Roman Empire? That was the beginning of this dispute. And you said in introduction, that's when they started calling this the Empire of the Greeks, the Empire right. of Constantinople. Those that's the first statements that's not the Roman Empire. And those are always political. And as you said, when they're trying to be respectful, then they call it the empire of new Rome. Um, so this dispute that this thing can't be what it was, it can't really be the Roman empire. It has to be something else does stretch all the way back to the ninth century um, and was contested. And when it was conquered by the crusaders in the 13th century, they were, pretty certain that they didn't want to conquer the Roman Empire, they wanted to conquer the Empire of the Greeks. Um, so this is, it's a matter of real contention. Um, and then as soon as the, uh, another sort of pre 19th century work that this does has to do with the establishment of the Renaissance as an independent period in which they claimed themselves to be recovering antiquity. And if antiquity never fell and never died, you really can't renaissance it. Right. So that whole narrative that the West recovered antiquity all on its own requires that the Eastern Roman Empire, the new Roman Empire had to be non-extant, right? And so from that period on, and it's largely 19th century tellings of stories of the Renaissance, but even late 18th century, um, if you're going to have a Renaissance period, you have to kill the Roman Empire off, right? It has to die. And that's where we get the Byzantine undead zombie from, right? When, when Gibbon said that it subsisted for 1,058 years in a state of premature and perpetual decay, right? <laughs> because right, he's going to try to kill the fall of the Roman Empire off by barbarism and religion, Right. And if you want it to die because of barbarism and religion, it has to die sometime in reasonable temporal proximity to Christianization and the barbarian invasions. Right. And so what do you do? The thing doesn't die. Well, it's premature perpetual decay. It's a zombie. It's a zombie. Right? That's right. <laughs> so it's there, not dead. It's the eternal undead millennial civilization that, but, you know, of not Rome. Yes. And it's, it's a Plutarch reading, Aristotle quoting, Homer quoting civilization all the way through, right? All the way through. And so that classicism has to be denied and that vitality has to be unplugged. Um, so that's why we can't have a Roman empire subsisting in the Eastern Mediterranean, right? right. The, and so insofar as Western civilization is defined by 
a rational, valorized, creative antiquity, right? And then a period of dark ages with a kind of religion and superstition and darkness to be recovered by a renaissance and a, a resurgence of rationality, right? I remember Gibbon again, jumping from the renaissance to the 18th century, he imagined antiquity as a place of enlightened secularism, right? If you're gonna have it be enlightenment, superstition, enlightenment, right? Then you not only have to have a dead Roman empire subsisting in zombie state in the Eastern Mediterranean, but it can't be the real Roman empire because a real Roman empire can't be Christian, right? If it's going to be rationality, religion, rationality, right. um, that narrative is also going to say that you have to cleave the Roman empire in half and kill one half of it and hence make it Byzantine. Right. So that's a, one of the big and that's the one that I think causes the most damage still now to scholars is when we're studying the religion of the Roman Empire, because the people who study you know, medieval Roman religion, you know, they're absolutely blind to all the aspects of it that are just like classical Roman religion, because we're taught, oh, it's orthodoxy. Right. Yeah, and how does the empire start? It starts with, with uh, Constantine and the Christianization. There's a big disciplinary divide there. Uh, there's there are very very few bridges from ancient Roman religion, yeah. in fact possibly none, um, to you know yeah. me medieval East Roman Orthodoxy. Even though I think there are many links and lines of continuity, um, but but I want to emphasize to our audience again how important the this template of a classical period followed by a period of decline, followed by a revival is in our, or in Western thinking about history, it's kind of ingrained and it's almost like necessary, right? For, for us to find it. And, and the experience of the East Roman empire just doesn't match that at all. And I remember um, Anthony Littlewood, he, uh, the way he put it was <laughs> that um, Byzantium didn't have a Renaissance because it didn't need one. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it had never lost touch with the classical sources. It, mm -hmm. I mean, the Renaissance is fundamentally a society that operates in a vernacular, that'd be it German, Italian, French, whatever, rediscovering Latin and then later Greek. There's nothing to rediscover in Byzantium. Mm -hmm. they, everyone who was educated was always educated in the same classical and Christian texts and, you know. I mean, it had some ups and downs for sure, but there was no radical break. And so the whole paradigm just doesn't fit. But if you're committed to it, then you have to exclude, you know, Byzantium from the whole picture. Um, and, and I would argue that the existence of the Eastern world means that that picture is fundamentally not true. It was, I was a, a first year in college and I did an intensive Western civilization sequence that had courses in uh, history and in philosophy and in literature. And they all started with Homer or Plato and Aristotle. And you know, by Thanksgiving, we were into Rome. And then by May, we were all in Boston, right? It got up to the 20th century. <laughs> um, and so the trajectory of this thing was from Greece steadily north and steadily West. Yes, that's right? right. Yes. Right. So we got all the way across the Atlantic. Um, and then by the time we got to the end, Greece was part of the Orient. Right. Yes. Um, and then I started reading about, well, this, the, I had a Roman history class at the same time. And the teacher said, well, you know, it actually didn't end. I was like, wait, what do you mean it didn't end? <laughs> it, this, this, um, it's just Fundamentally, yeah, that story of the Western progression of Western Civ isn't true to the reality of what happened. And so when people say that they're Byzantinists and uphold this discourse of Byzantium, they are sort of docilely going along with this false story rather than allowing the, the text that we're, we're interacting with and the people that we're studying to be maximally disruptive. Yeah, um, I remember... Uh, Garth Foden, he, he put it once in a phrase that I, I always remember, which is not all roads lead out of antiquity to the Renaissance. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, there are lots of other paths. And I don't think he meant Byzantium. I think he meant more something like um, the Islamic, you know, the caliphate culture and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's fine. I mean, it works for a lot of things. And so to construct this idea 
of Europe and the genealogy of civilizations, right, that we have to cobble together in order to create that progression from even, you know, sometimes Greece, sometimes Sumeria, right? right? And it moves exactly as you said, it moves steadily to the West and to the North until you end up in Boston or New York. Um, You have to, you know, pick and choose the parts Mm -hmm. that you want. But essentially, there's, there's some underlying threads to this. And you've mentioned a couple of them already. One is the Roman tradition. So the Roman tradition has to remain the preserve of Western institutions. You mentioned Charlemagne and the, the medieval German empire. Um, and you have to exclude other claimants, right? As being not really Roman, as if the Franks were Roman. <laughs> and the other one is classical learning, right? So classical learning is another preserve of Europe. And yeah, if the Byzantines had it, you know, they didn't understand its essence or phrase it however you want. They were just keeping it for the Italians. <laughs> they were gestating it. Well, it's because of the feminization of the culture. They gestated it, right? So you, you keep it, but it gets birthed by the Renaissance men later. Um, so the, the Byzantine classicists were so um, thoughtless and imitative that they merely copied it without thinking about it, um, which is manifestly false if you pay attention to anything that they wrote. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah, so you mentioned a few times that there's a fundamental gender component to this, and I, and I agree. Um, so you want to talk a little bit about this? Because I think as one loses Romanness and as one loses the, uh, a genuine appreciation of classical culture, one also loses masculinity within this paradigm, mm-hmm. or, or, or the reverse. As you lose masculinity, you lose those other things. Maybe right. that's how it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think if you... Look at any of the invective against Byzantium that comes from the, the 19th and early 20th century. Um, there's some things, there's some complaints, right? The, the Byzantines were superstitious, right? The Byzantines were extremely religious and they believed in crazy miracle stories. They believed in, in ointments and, and in rituals. Um, and that's a way of then constructing Western men as rational, right? And, and enlightened. Um, and more Protestant, right? So it's the the rejection of candles and incense and and rituals and priests as part of this. And the Byzantines, and of course I use Byzantine to mean the people in this construct, people within the discourse. Uh, Byzantines were imitative. They would just copy. They would take an image from an older text and write it exactly the same way. And they take the picture and do it exactly the same way. And that's a way of pointing out that Western people are in fact creative that the Renaissance artists, artists are always making the new things. Um, and that associates the Byzantines with craft, with decorative, um, which has always been seen as, as women's work and hence less creative and less masculine, right? So the artist, you know, Picasso is a masculine artist because it's creative and new. Um, whereas embroidery and decoration, that's women's stuff. The imitative nature of the Byzantine decorative arts makes it unmasculine. Um, Byzantines are also, they're slavish. Uh, One text calls them willing slaves. Uh, They participated in Oriental despotism that defines the West as free, as upstanding, as as men trying to assert their own freedoms and care for themselves. It associates the West with democracy and the East with despotism. Um, And there's, the, the fact that they were the power hungry women. There's Theodora and Irene and, and Anna. Right. Uh, there's this continuing trope of the woman who is grasping out of power, uh, who is trying to influence men who spoke up in councils um, and um, which shows that Western women ought to be subordinate. You ought to have a proper uh, relationship of genders with men being more uh, in control. Um, and the, the Eastern men, the Byzantine men are seen as being effeminate, that they didn't fight right. They, they wore silks, they were, took care of pens and pencils and, and thought about texts, whereas the Western men had swords and chain mail and armor and were strong and dominating. Right? It's about making both the Crusaders and the more modern Western men are strong and dominant and not these effeminate fops who would sit around and, and write all day. Right, completely unlike the Western Renaissance men who would write all day in creative ways, right, right? Right. properly masculine writing. Um, and then there's the, the idea that the Orient is decadent, 
right? It's it's really they're not Roman anymore. They've declined from Roman greatness to being sort of decadence, which generally means they had too much money, too much silk, you know, slaves in silk underwear, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and they were indolent rather than hardworking. And of course, they had sexual indulgence. There's like too involved in sexuality. Now, this you can see how all of that. Um, ultimately has to do with gender. And that's also, that's the work that's most like Said's description of Orientalism. I mean, that should be very familiar to anybody who's familiar with uh, Said's description of an Orientalist discourse, right? And so yeah. it's just, that's piling that all onto Byzantium. And I've come to see that as a, for, I've known for decades that it's, it's an invective that denigrates the civilization but trying to figure out why exactly uh, it all works, seeing, recognizing that these almost all has to do with gender. It's almost all about defining the East as uh, female and effeminate and supine and passive and the West as masculine and strong and dominating. And that's what fits so seamlessly into the colonizing discourse that justified European domination of the world. Right. And so what what I don't know is this and in some sense, an original description of of Byzantium in such a way to create this culture or were the people who were writing this just so full of this um, Orientalist discourse of European colonizing powers that we ought to be ruling these things that it just sort of spilled over. Right. Um, it's it's kind of hard for me at this point to know if there's anything particular about Byzantine Orientalism that distinguishes it from every other kind of Orientalism. Right. But I do know that our field hasn't recognized it as such. Right. You know, right. Or, or reckoned with it. Yeah, we haven't dealt with it. Was the you know departments of Oriental studies, right? Exactly. Saw this back in the seventies. Saw it in the eighties. Yes. Uh, no, the, our field hasn't come to grips with it. And, you know, for whatever outcome might come from such a reckoning, we haven't even really begun it. Yeah. Um, and it's, I, I should add, it's it's not just the Roman and the classical dimension, but it's also the Greek aspect, mm -hmm. uh, right? So e even in calling them the East Romans Greeks, which in many contexts might be a a positive thing to say, that's not how it was used. <laughs> and, no, so they're degenerate Greeks as well. Um, and you, you know, we're not talking about this now, but it also has, um, this plays out also in studies of language and linguistics, mm -hmm. where you know, the kind of Greek, essentially closer to modern Greek that they were speaking becomes another mechanism by which to deny them Right. you know, their standing in, in the classical firmament. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think you're right. Our, our field hasn't begun to deal with this. And in particular, it's relationship with other fields. Mm -hmm. To a certain degree, all of this, this nexus of, of ideas, of this discourse, it serves the interests of other fields at yeah at our expense to, you know, now I don't think that's necessarily the case anymore. Um, that is, I don't think that there are actual fields out there that are gunning for us to stay in this Byzantine rubric because they benefit from it. But I think that there was a time when that did happen. Um, and we're just kind of left with that baggage. And I, I have this bizarre sense that Byzantinists are more wedded to that discourse than the places where it came from. Okay. Um, but anyway, so yeah. what you're calling for, if you think it through, is essentially, ah, this might be a strong way to put it, but the abolition of this discipline as a separate discipline and its reconfiguration along different lines. But this would require changing a lot of practices, a lot of our, how we understand our relationship with other fields, um, it'd be it, you know, classics, medieval studies, Renaissance studies, er, early modern European studies, and Islamic studies, right? D do you think that we should be taking on something like that, like of that that magnitude? I think that all of those disciplinary distinctions and fields are 
also grappling with the larger changes in our society, certainly in North America, and changes in the academy, that none of them are so stable or so fixed that we should um, be deferential to those boundaries, um, or there's really much to be gained from that. Yes. Um, in that, you know, the, there may have been a time in which the the normal, you know, the cursus of an undergraduate liberal arts curriculum would have had ancient history and then medieval history and then Renaissance history, and then or a big survey of Western civilization. I don't know very many curricula that work that way anymore. I think that there's world history and that even the Western Civ classes are, that's an embattled space and Western medieval classes compete with 18th century Japan classes and 16th century China and African history and Latin American history. And there's this huge buffet in most North American large history departments of dozens of courses and differences of different places and times um, in which one set of courses doesn't really have priority. Right. I mean, 20th century US is probably gonna be the biggest class. Um, but after that, is there, are there requirements? Most places would have a pre-modern requirement if they have any, right. and then it's anything pre-modern. Um, so, and I think particularly uh, people who study Western medieval history, you know, they're making a big push to go for the global middle ages and reconceive medieval as a global term, um, which means that they're open to rethinking this. And so now is the moment for the people who study the later Roman empire to be speaking truth rather than saying, oh, I'm a Byzantinist. Right? Yeah, so I, I agree entirely. And there's another factor that's kicking in at right this time, which is with the downsizing of academic departments. Yeah. Um, there are just fewer specialists. And so you're not going to get the full gamut of fields that used to support, right, the, the traditional narrative. Right, right now, uh, you know, there's a, a lot more is being, like it's opening, paradoxically, it's opening up a little bit more mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, pre-modern is more of a thing. Global Middle Ages is a thing in part because you don't have a separate French, medieval France, medieval Britain, medieval Germany, medieval oh. Italy like you used to. Um, and so that might be, I mean, sadly, but it, it's working in the direction of sort of loosening those distinctions. And there's but, a lot more room for us to move into. Yes. I mean, if yeah. you're going to be the one pre-modern person, you don't really have to be deferential to some other vision. You can speak truth however you want it. So let's, let's talk about, let's talk about some of the specific fields whose interests we might run up against. And I'm just saying it, this is just like, this is just intuition and instinct. Like I don't have, you know, any data about this, but I suspect that there's not going to be much resistance from historians of ancient Rome. Yeah. L like from what I'm reading that they're doing, they're m very much into sort of fluidity and renegotiation and all of that. Right. <laughs> and I don't think that there's anything um, programmatically that blocks them from accepting uh, a Greek speaking East Roman Christian empire. Like, why not? Like, sure, get, bring it on board. Why not? Right. Essentially, they're extending the scope of their fields. They got nothing to lose, literally. Um, the, the other irony is that I have found Arabists, especially early Islamic experts, to be the most receptive, mm -hmm. in part because the, the Arabs had no incentive to denature Byzantium as something, you know, non-Roman. And they call it that all the time. And sometimes right. Arabists are surprised, like, wait, why do you call it this? Like all of our sources keep saying, Rum, why are you? Right. Yeah. Why are you denying reality why to you... go along with this narrative of Western Civ whenever all the sources call it Rome? Yeah, yeah. And you, you can see, that, yeah, I, like Hugh Kennedy, for example, in his book on the Islamic conquest, and, and in the preface, he's like scratching his head yeah. as to why we could be calling it that. Um, okay. But I think that there's going to be a little bit more tension with medieval studies, especially... So yeah, there are two kinds of medieval studies. One is just the kind of neutral period, like 
what you said, the global middle ages, anything that falls into that range. And there are a lot of people who are open to that and that's fine. Right. But I think there's a very strong contingent. Like if you go to Kalamazoo or, you know, one of the other conferences, you realize that the, demographically there's this huge center of gravity that's sort of orbiting around France, France. Britain, yeah, Northern Italy, and maybe Germany, if it, that's not too exotic. Yeah, German monasteries. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so you cross the Rhine, you're kind of slumming it into like, eh, but you don't cross the, you know, the East-West divide. At, at least that's the impression that I get, that there is, there is some resistance there. Well, the, the only person who's ever um, said, you know, I, I really have a problem with you, your use of Roman, Leonora, uh, was someone who did Western medieval history. And it's because um, of the, the little city on the Tiber, right? That no, yes. <laughs> has to be reserved for people in Italy. Um, and, and it would just be confusing, right? And so that's the, the argument from confusion is that if you don't call them Byzantines, everyone's going to get confused. Um, but we were dealing with students for whom all of these terms were new and confusing. <laughs> And so from the perspective of the undergraduate, it's all confusing and all new. You can call them whatever. Exactly. Um, and I think, why not talk about old Rome and new Rome? I mean, there are ways <laughs> that you can distinguish. Uh, and you could call us the, 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 the new, talk about the new Roman Empire. I think about the Eastern Roman Empire that does keep the, the East-West thing going. Uh, so perhaps new Roman Empire is better. Um, but you only have to establish this like once or twice in paragraph one, and people are going to yes. know what you're talking about. So unless you're talking about people who are actually going back and forth between Constantinople and old Rome, you're really not going to confuse too many people. Exactly. But I think that, that is, that's the strongest resistance I've gotten is that, oh, Leonora, you're just going to confuse everybody. Um, and then the other place that I see there's going to be big resistance is we haven't talked about... Um, Orthodox studies, right? right? And that's a place where Byzantium has a totally different meaning. Um, and I think within, you know, Byzantine and modern Greek studies, right? There, the Byzantine has a real role. And that's a work we didn't talk about when you're talking about the, the things this discourse does is that by turning them into Byzantines, you can allow them to be Greeks all the time, really, right? right. You want to have Greek continuity from, you know, Athena, to now, um, the having them all turn into Romans for a thousand years or you know like eighteen hundred years is really problematic. So if you're calling them Byzantines and everyone's acknowledging that's a fake name, um, it it aligns and, and occludes what what the fakeness is about. Um, so you don't have to deal with them really turning into Romans, right? And so you had a conversation on a previous podcast about identity. And you're talking about this idea. Yeah. About oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is a problem for the Greek national narrative insofar as, you know, people are still wedded to it. And I should say that Greeks and in Greece and Greek historiography is nowhere near, you know, monolithically committed to it. Right. Uh, my conversations, e even with, you know, non-experts, are always of a sense of confusion, despite what they've been taught in school. Um, <laughs> in fact, one of the best ways to get people to not believe a national paradigm is to teach it in school. <laughs> <laughs> well, I gotta tell you, when I was in grad school, I spent a couple of summers in Athens and one of them, nice lady on the bus, I was gonna go to Sparta for, for a weekend visit and she sort of sat down and like, let's ask the nice foreigner what she's doing. And so I was trying to have this conversation and I explained that I studied the medieval Romans, right? And she said, no, you should study the Byzantines. And then I tried to explain it to her. And she told me while Falmerayer was wrong, <laughs> why <laughs> the Greeks are the Greeks <laughs> and there hasn't been anything other than Greeks all the way to Sparta. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been 200 years since Falmerayer and they're still, yeah. I mean, that um, would that would have been early nineties. Oh, it's I, still I think it's be really different. But, it's still uh, there. Yeah, I, I got an earful. Of, yeah. So the term the term Byzantine in the context of modern Greek national discourse is exactly what you said. 
it acts as a placeholder for what we know, nod, nod, wink, wink, heavy winking are really Greeks. And if you want, you know, primary source evidence for it, they just point to Western medieval sources. Right. Like there it is. We're not going to point to contemporary Arabic sources because they say something very different. Right. And, and so it's almost like, yeah, we're just kind of deferred to the medieval narrative, which reinforces the modern Greek one paradoxically. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So there is this sort of subterranean yeah. connection there. But you're entirely right about the students, uh, by the way, about the, the argument that you'll confuse the students. When I first, okay. when I started teaching at OSU, I thought naively, I was coming out of grad school. So, you know, yeah. that, okay, I'm teaching, you know, Byzantine when I was teaching a Byzantine course. I have to explain this to them in the terms that they know, which I thought were the standard Western narrative, you know, Greeks, Romans, Boston. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out they didn't even, they didn't have those coordinates. No. And at first I was very frustrated. I was like, wait, what do you mean you, you don't know Pericles? But then like a, just a few months into it, I felt liberated. Like, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> Like I, we can just, we can just do it however we want. Right. Which then means that if we choose to teach Byzantine empire, we are choosing to recreate that paradigm and that discourse from scratch from just about yeah. everybody in our class. The people who have anything, any prior stuff, they're going to be a few people, right? And they're, they might be people who you know, and I think to get back to the Orthodox studies who people who know Byzantine is like Byzantine music is church music, right? Um, but aside of that, you know, people aren't going to have any idea. And therefore, you know, we are free to construct the narratives and the stories that we want from our texts. So why speak falsehood? So I don't think that, I think the real thing that's holding us back and you say, where are we going to get resistance? Um, the resistance is going to come from the Byzantinists because they don't want to do the hard work Absolutely. of figuring out what they're talking about. Absolutely. It's really tricky to say, I'm going to scrub out all these terms and figure out how am I going to describe it? Because you might be fine for your one tiny particular thing, but how do you set that in a larger context? And if we take away the scaffolding narrative, suddenly you're one little person that you're studying is floating free and you got to figure out what to anchor it to. Right. And we have not done why we, I mean, you and me, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we have not written the book that's going to explain the new structure that's going to let everything get hung on. Um, so, yeah. So I'm writing a new history of Byzantium right now. It's big. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so full disclosure, okay. I, I use the term Byzantine and in, in the titles of books and articles, uh, in, R rarely anymore in the in the guts of the right um i i take it that anybody who's read past the cover <laughs> the, f the first page knows what i'm talking about right. um but i do use it and in the roman land book i had a a statement in the after the acknowledgement somewhere toward the beginning where i said you know i'm not ditching the term byzantium because right now there is a discipline of Byzantine studies. Every part of that discipline is named that. And I'm addressing that discipline, you know, with some substantive challenges to the paradigm to be sure, but I, I'm not, I wanna be part of that conversation. I'm not setting myself outside of it. And in a certain sense, I feel like I'm, I've got one foot in two discourses, right? The one that we've had and the one that might be emerging um, so m at least my goal has been to try to work on the substantive issues of creating a new discourse to, so that the term that's left is just a hollow shell, and then we can decide how to move forward. But there is a discipline right now. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, pretend that it isn't uh, there, uh, but what might it look like? Let's say that we've done the hard work. We've disentangled ourselves from all of these other discourses that have, you know, required us to, you know, keep mum about certain things and all that. And we've created that framework. What might that look like at that point? What you say, I mean, we don't know now. We're, you know, we're looking into the future and the field might be very resistant. And you're right. I think the main f focus of resistance is going to be within the field. 
But what might it look like afterwards? Can you, can, have you like tried to guess? I think what, what will happen if we drop Byzantium um, and actually get it out all, all the places, I think people will be stunned at how different it looks. Right. I think if you take books off the shelf that you have that you know to be good books um, written by modern scholars and you cross out the word Byzantines and you put in the word Romans, right? Um, you're going to read them differently, you know. Um, I think even your Roman land, right, which is one of the, my favorite books of yours, right? Um, I think the argument would have been stronger if you had just spoken the way the sources spoke and and used that term. And every spot, every time it comes up, it catches you back. Yes. It you yeah, back. No. 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 Like, no I, oh, God, why? I know um, what you mean. So so I think things things would really change. You know, and I think um, big changes would be if we actually do this, we would have Koniatis taught in Greek classes alongside Thucydides, right? So we would have good examples of um, Greek historical writing classes in, in departments of, of classics would all become departments of Greek and Latin, and they would be teaching texts that are astonishingly good examples of classical Greek that go up to the 13th century and beyond. Roman history classes, if you're going to teach a class in the Roman Empire, it would routinely go through the 13th century. You know, I think classes are dealing with European colonialism. If, you do, if, if you're going to be studying uh, colonialism, oh, sure. start yeah, with the yeah. Crusades. Yeah, yeah, right? absolutely. And I think that this turn in Crusade studies, that this turn is like 30, 40 years old now, but the turn that we have to take seriously the religious convictions, um, right? And, and not think about them as marauding conquerors out for money and glory and colonialism, um, that will, will get readjusted to realities if we think about them conquering and colonizing the Roman empire, right? Rather yeah, than just yeah. you know, fixing up the Middle East, right? You know where I have a problem um, in the history that I'm writing? Because I'm trying to do the things that you're saying. Um, yeah. And yeah, it, 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 I've reached a point where it makes zero sense to me to use the term the Byzantines in any kind of narrative context. Right. Except in Southern Italy. I don't <laughs> know. I don't know what to do there because there are other Romans in, in play there. Right. It sounds weird to call them old Romans and new Romans, especially if you're like talking about like the 11th century, both of them are quite old. So you're trying to distinguish between, you can say an imperial agent, mm -hmm. an imperial army, except then sometimes you get the Western imperial army showing up and all the right. Heinrichs and, and honestly, that is, that's a tricky context. And so in that context, I have used Byzantine just to distinguish the East Romans from the West Romans, but only in that context. I, th I think the sources that you're using have words in them <laughs> and you could use those words. Right, so why the, not there use Greek, right? The, if your sources yeah. are Latin and they're taught, you know. Um, oh, I see you what know, you mean. In that, if their Latin sources are talking about the Greeks, I think it's fair to talk about the Greeks in that context, right? Um, it just, just in the same way that we talk about, you know, Greek historical writing right. like, written in Greek, even though the political ideology is Roman. That's um, an interesting idea. I'm just, I, I think you're smart enough. If you don't let yourself off the hook, I think you can come up with something. You know, this is exactly what I'm saying is that it's it's hard work to let go of one structuring paradigm and come up yeah. with a different solution. Um, but it's also it's just easier to keep on using the same stuff. Um, but the people who are fighting in southern Italy, they weren't confused. Right. They could work it out. Well, I mean, it is a very confusing <laughs> It's a pretty confusing area. But I hadn't I hadn't thought of doing that. You know, I was so. um uh, um, careful to not avoid to avoid the Greek term for fear of you know the interjecting a modern national narrative right. and confusing things. But you're right; we don't have um, many or hardly any Eastern Roman sources about Southern Italy. They don't talk about it that much. Most of the sources are Western sources, and they refer to Greeks. And you know, I, I could simply say, in this context, I'm just using the local terminology. Right. Right. That's good. 
Huh. I mean, you kind of, you, you, you ought to give a, and I'm sure you do, give an aside explaining Byzantine, right? So you're glossing your terms in any case, right? You can gloss them. Gloss yeah, them. I, I hardly use, uh, hardly use Byzant Byzantine at all. And, yeah. and yeah. It's, it, it's remarkable that it doesn't come up. It, there's no need for it in any other context. Well, I think if it's, so you're writing this one book, but it, but if everybody in the field would take it on to rethink it, then we would have a lot of different visions about how to talk about it and a lot of different solutions, right? And then if you were to check in in five, 10 years, the field would be looking very different. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you think about how quickly, all right, so Department of Oriental Studies, they all became Near Eastern Studies. Right. Um, you know, but going back to my college days, you know, I went, took ancient Near Eastern history and day one, it turned into history of Southwest Asia and why. Um, that field dropped Orientalism awfully quickly, right? And, and we're just, we haven't really thought through the problem, um, but if we put our minds to it, I think that enough solutions will present that we can have a new vocabulary in place, you know, as soon as we just decide that we're, we're just gonna do it, right? right? The only people that we're confusing are ourselves. No yes. one else really cares. And how are we going to, now that we're in this marketplace of ideas with all of these courses, none of which have a prerequisite, none of which have a requirement, right. right? We need to make what we're doing seem interesting and exciting and relevant. Um, and so teaching a civilization that's, that's defined the way it is because it is not Western Civ in an era in which everyone's given up on Western Civ anyway, um, just doesn't seem to be the best way to convince <laughs> people that what we're doing is relevant or interesting. Right, right, right. right. Um, no? So I'm I'm hoping for Eastern Roman Empire. I'm thinking the, um, you know, one of the next books I want to write, I want to start with Pompey conquering it and finish up with the Crusaders conquering it, you know, was it you know, a thousand years later? It's interesting that you say that because that's how Ray Van Dam taught it at Michigan. Mm. Um, it was, no, he had, you know, he wasn't qu questioning the Byzantine paradigm, but his Roman history course or Roman empire or whatever it was, it, it, it went from exactly that, from Pompey yeah. to Charlemagne, East and West. Yeah. So yeah, that can be done. And that was one of the most successful history courses at Michigan. Um, undergrad uh, is a 200 right. level. Um, it's interesting that you should say East Roman as a operating rubric for our field from now on, because that's what Bury had proposed a hundred years ago. Exactly. And because he was there, he was present at the creation. Yeah. And he, when he saw that, you know, Krumbacher was going for this Byzantine paradigm at first, he balked and yeah. he said, no, this, this creates the false the illusion that we're talking about something different here and we're going to miss a lot of things. And then like 20 or 20 some years later when he edited the Cambridge Medieval History, he, yeah. he, yeah, he had come around and he has a note where he says, you know, whatever. <laughs> but I remember reading that stuff in the nineties and being stunned that all these things that I were thought was like Leonora's original thoughts about, you know, why Byzantium is the zombie empire, right? And then I'm reading this guy writing in the 1880s, 1890s, who's yes. saying all this stuff. Yes, yes. He, he made all the arguments and then it was it was as if he hadn't spoken. Yeah, and he wasn't alone, um, but somehow this, this prevailed. Right. Um, and, I, you know, Krumbacher had a lot to do with that. Um, yeah. And I think we are a lot freer as professors at Big Ten universities in the United States to teach whatever we want in whatever way we want. And our colleagues in Europe, where money and lines come in funding streams that are tied to research projects, right. uh, there, there's much more... Um, not sclerosis isn't a, a good word, but they're uh, locked into institu the institutional paradigms. Yeah. 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 yeah you yeah, can't, yeah. you don't have the freedom to change. You got to, you're in your silo and you got to stay there because that's where the money is. Um, yeah. So uh, changing the whole, whole field might be the global field might be a lot harder. Um, and also I think Byzantium continues to do different kinds of work in Eastern Europe. Um, and people might have more affection for the term or have different associations with the term um, because it means different things in those communities. Um, 
that I'm not part of that. So yeah, I don't yeah, feel yeah. beholden to that. And I think if I can speak truth to the past here in the, the dairy land of Wisconsin, um, that that will help. Um, but I, you know, I don't want to start telling people who have um, devotion to the term because it forms part of their identity that they are somehow a post Byzantine person. Huh. Uh, I'll let you know if I meet any such person. Um, yeah, I don't know. You know yeah, yeah. It might be. Um, you no, know, you're right about Europe, and we sh maybe shouldn't digress into that, yeah. but the institutional structures are less flexible mm -hmm. uh, there um, in all kinds of ways, but I'll just give you a small example that in a number of countries, you can teach only specifically what you were hired to. And there's a job advertisement that, that, that the job that you applied for and what it says there, mm -hmm. that's all you can do. Mm -hmm. And 15 years later, you might have developed an expertise in some other thing, you know, like you and I have done, <laughs> but no, you can't teach that. You, you, you have to stay within what you were hired to, to do, which is your field of expertise. And it's very restrictive. And yeah. you can't like change your field of expertise. What? Right. That doesn't work. Right. Yeah. So changing those structures is, is, is difficult. It just means that that field there can't change. Right. Um, but that doesn't mean they, they fossilized and, and solidified and, and turned into stone um, intellectual paradigms of a hundred years ago. Your discourse, the discourses you were talking about. Yeah. 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 They're they, just there. They're bureaucratized. Yeah. Yeah. In the names of our journals. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like you said, uh, Oriental studies has has changed, and uh, yeah, we'll see. I'll, I I still need to. I'm I'm still in the process of. Uh, I'm still transitioning. Yeah, but I would do it. I mean, um, one of the absolutely brilliant book um, in our field lately is um, here we go. It's um, George D. Macopoulos's Colonizing Christianity. Right? Yes, I, I had him on the podcast. Yeah, Greek and Latin religious identity, right? Yeah. Read the last 10 pages of that, substituting Roman for Byzantine. And the, the implications of his argument are so much stronger than what he says. He's right, but he's a right. lot writer. <laughs> he's a lot more correct. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And the argument is much more powerful if you really seep into and, and dig into the reality that they're talking about the conquest of the Romans. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It changes uh, how you understand the narrative. Leonora, uh, we're, we're out of time. Okay. Um, I, I know that we could go on about this for, for much longer, but I, you know, I try to keep these to about an hour or so. Yep, thank you. No, thank you. Um, we did throw a bunch of bombs around. A little bit. And you know, maybe some of them will be absolutely fine if you keep using the B word. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I, I'm still gonna have to use it for a little while. Okay. Um, but uh not to work. We're working our way towards something, you know, potentially more interesting, and that's the important thing. All right. So thank you again. This has been wonderful. Absolutely. Thanks for your time.